Hi, this is Sean Wildermuth. It's time for another coding short. This time I'm going to dig into generics. Now I'm old enough to remember when C-sharp didn't have generics. We were using array lists for everything and doing all sorts of casts just to make everything work. So I was a big fan of generics when it was introduced. There's a couple of features in generics that I think some people miss. They think about generics as just being about collections. So we're going to talk about generics not only in collections, but also in classes and methods and talk about inference and some of the things that I think might surprise you about generics in C-sharp. Let's take a look. So let's talk about generics. And I want to talk about it in a few different examples, because it may seem obvious if you're used to using generic collections that that's what generics are really about. But there's a lot more going on than that. Let's start with .NET 1.0, way, way back in uh, 2001, when I got started with C Sharp and .NET, and there were no things like generics. And so I've written this code a lot, ArrayList, list equals new ArrayList. And what ArrayList was, and still is, is a collection that is non-specialized. It just allows you to have a collection of objects. So if I say list.add, it's going to be some object value. And in our case, we can say one because, of course, that is an object. And if I say add one here, what's it going to do? It's going to also box this as an object. And so when we do for each, we could do something like, you know, right line item here. That will work, but it only works because right line is going to treat each of those things that's being right lined to as an object and calling to string to get at it, right? And we want something different. And there were a bunch of code generators back then that would allow you to create these type safe classes and was generating a bunch of code. And so in .NET 2, it quickly said, you know what? We need generics. Generics are important. And so this should be closer to what you've been writing probably for a long time, which is a new list. And let's say that is of string. And let's bring in those generic collections. And now we can see that we have the list of strings, but of course it's not going to allow this because we're telling it what kinds of things we want to store in them. The way that the for each works is still the same, except that this item, of course, is going to be a string. It's going to know it's a string because this is a generic parameter of the list class, right? And so, of course, this add one no longer works for us because it has to be a string. And so if we were to do something like two here, right, it's a string, it's type checked. And also when we get items out of it, whether it's in the for each or looking at the array indexer or a bunch of things like that, they're all going to know about this being the string because this is the type specifically for your use, a list of string. And so if you've done C Sharp any amount of time, you've done this. This is pretty basic C Sharp 101 sort of things that you were learning, right? But generics go way, way beyond that. So let's talk about using generics in your own classes. So let's create a public class here. I'm going to call animal. Let's say I just want to have a constructor that allows me to pass in, let's say, an integer for an ID, right? And then go ahead and assign a field so we can get at it and we're all good, right? There's an essential problem here is in that it's assuming that the integer is the type of the ID that I want to expose. And so let's create a property here. Let's say we have an ID here, and that's great. But in some cases, you're going to want to be able to supply a generic argument here to say, you know what, I know I need an ID, but I don't know what type I need it to be. Different people might have different reasons for it. So let's introduce T to our class. And what is this T but a templated argument? And so we can use this. And remember, this is a type, not a piece of data, but a type. And so if we just replace T here, Let's assume that we can't set it. I'm making this way harder than it needs to be. Return this.id, right? What we're essentially saying here is that when you supply this, you're going to tell me what kind of ID I want to support. This could be a GUID. This could be a, an object that has more than one property that I'm not going to need to know about what that is ahead of time. And more importantly, when I have an, another class, let's call it dog, that derives from animal, 
I can go ahead and tell it what the type is there. Sorry, I need to say class here. And so I'll need my own constructor for dog. And I'll do the same thing. I'll say string ID. And that string ID means that I can just then pass it down to base ID. And that works because the call for calling the base constructor here is going to be a string because we specified it here. This dog doesn't need to be generic for all of this to work. Now, what if we wanted to really define what could be this, right? Because we could certainly change this and let's say make this an exception, right? And then we'd need to return a new exception with some piece of data in it, right? Of course, exception doesn't make any sense for an ID. So we'd like to be able to smartly talk about what this can be. And so there's a few different ways to do that, but you do this with what's called generic constraints. And so in our case, we're going to tell it where T is what? Is I disposable, right? We're essentially telling it that whatever can be in here has to live up to some set of constraints. And of course, this doesn't work because dog's going to say string can't be used because there's no explicit conversion from a string to I disposable, right? Because it's assuming that this is going to be those rule sets that you really need. Now, what if I just want it to be some object instead of a primitive type? The sort of trick there is to say new. Instead of saying object here, which could work, what we really want to say is that we have the ability of being able to construct this with an empty constructor or with a constructor of some known type, right? The new is saying that we have a way to construct these. But if we don't have the constraint, we can continue using things like string or int or whatever we want. But we also have essentially a problem, and that is what happens to this T when I want to be able to generate it. So let's talk about that by talking about two different ideas here. So one of the things that I find that I commonly use is generics on methods. Now we talked about a generic in this class, but let's go ahead and just create a method outside the animal class, and I'll just call this public T, and I'll use that T again get value. By the way, the T isn't important here. This could be T value, could be just value, whatever you want it to be. This is just a name. So here I'm going to go ahead and say T value and let's go ahead and return some value. So if we want to say return here and generate whatever the property here was that it wants to return, I I have to get rid of public here. How do I do that? I could say new T value. But this doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't is it doesn't have a constraint that says that we can construct them in this way. And so if we were going to use that constraint where t value is new, then that would work, right? But without the constraint here, it doesn't know what to do here. And so another option here is to use default t value. What this does is, depending on what is being passed here, is it can create a default version of this. So we don't need the constraint. So if this is an integer, you're going to get a new integer of zero. If this is a string, it's going to be an empty string. If it's an object that has an empty constructor, it can create that. Otherwise, you'll get a runtime error. But in this way, we can generate the new values just as well. And again, we can continue to use constraints to sort of handle that. And so if we look at, let's say, val called get value and say we want a string. What happens? This val, the return argument, is going to end up being a string. If this is an object, same thing. You're going to get returned an object. And if this is an integer, you're going to get an integer, right? So we're able to do that sort of thing. But another notion or another strong use case for generics inside of methods is this interesting notion of implying the type. So if I say that we're going to pass in a T value, whatever this value is, and let's call it our value, and I know this doesn't really change anything, but we're just going to return the value, right? We don't do any real work here, but maybe we did. And so this is going to expect a value. So if I wanted this to be int, I could put one there, and of course that works, right? This is going to return actually that one back here in value. What's interesting is that C Sharp can infer that. So by saying get value one here, it goes, okay, 
You've passed me a one that passes here, so you must mean that this needs to be an int value here, an int value here, an int value here. So if I put a, a new dog here, what happens? What do we get back here in the value? We get a dog, right? Because whatever we're passed in here, we're going to get back out that same type. And so this can be a very powerful idea here. Imagine if you need to parse out some piece of information and you want to get it out. What you'll often see is an object get value, let's say some sort of key here, and then they need to return list key, right? They're going to return some object that they're getting from this list. And this is pseudocode, so it's not going to work. And what does this look like when someone's actually calling it this way? I'm just going to call it get so we don't have any confusion here. So I'm going to go ahead and get X because I'm running out of names. I can come up with the top of my head. And let's call get with hello. But in order to turn it into what I really need, let's say if I know it's a string, then I end up having to cast it, right? And let's just say we're going to return the first one there just to get rid of the idea. So this works because it assumes that this is going to return us a string and maybe it's something we know about. But more importantly, if we want to use the generic argument, we can go ahead and say t here, get the key, and then just say as t, right? Whatever is returned here, I'm going to try to cast it. Of course, this doesn't work for the constraints because this could be a class. So instead of as, which only works on reference types, let's go ahead and just do t here, right? And what does this mean? This isn't a lot better, but it does mean that you can be very specific. And I think this reads a lot better than the casting. The casting also is sort of hidden in here by saying what we want it to be. The last thing I want to talk about are lambdas and how generics play a role here. So if I wanted to write a lambda, let's just call it f for function, and I want it to just run some operation like write line one, right? And then later on, I should be able to call it as f. But I need to tell it what this actually is. It can't implicitly create this because I need to create an action or a func. Now, action has no return value, but func does. And so that's the big difference between those. So I'm going to say action here. And what am I going to tell it? That our action has no parameters, right? Because we don't need to specify a argument if there's no parameters being passed to it. But what if we change this and say action string, right? Then it's going to complain here because it's going to expect this to be some value and then use that value here. So I then can say hello and this function works because it knows that it is expecting one string argument here. And that's kind of how actions and functions work. So let's copy this one more time and let's create it as a func just so you can see the difference here. So in func, the number of parameters you're going to use are at least one. Now, in the case of func string, what that actually is assuming is that you're going to have no parameters, but you're going to return something, in our case, like a string, right? And the chief idea behind the func and using these generic parameters is to specify the input as well as the output types. If there's just one argument in func, it's the output type. But if there's two, let's say integer and string, it means it's going to return a string, but it's going to expect an integer. In our case, that y should be the integer here. Well, what happens if we have integer string string, right? Then it's going to expect that the arguments are going to be id and name, because these first two arguments are specifying that this is going to be an int, this is going to be a string, and that it's going to return a string. That's what that last parameter is always there for. So z equals g5 bob, right? And so we can now use this func just like we could create a local function, but of course you can pass it around and do some other things that aren't possible. But we can now see what's really happening here is we're using generic parameters to specify what the lambda signatures are. And you're going to see this happen quite a bit, especially if you're going to allow people to pass in a lambda that you then execute. That's going to be a pretty common use case.
So hopefully you've gotten a sense of where generics matter more than just in the simple generic collections. We're going to see that the usefulness of using generics in creating generic classes, generic methods, and then of course lambdas, that we're going to start to use the real power of what generics are really about. Thanks for joining me on this coding short. My name is Sean Wildermuth. See you next time.